one thing we want to do in this series is just take a look at, at leadership from the Word of God through the life of David as we've continued to do. And to just to set the, set the scene and the stage for where we were last week, we talked about David, the unlikely one to be anointed king over Israel, the one who was brought out of the fields into the spotlight. And we learned that true greatness begins, what, out of the spotlight, Right? It doesn't begin in the spotlight, it begins outside of it. So the stage is set in this story in 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we'll be in our Bibles, is where David, who's been anointed, but he's not yet been appointed to the throne of the kingdom of Israel, he's serving under this this crazy guy, we're going to learn more about it, a guy named King Saul, who's basically the worst boss that you could ever imagine having. Like, this guy wants all the glory. He doesn't want to do any of the work. He's hyper, 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 hyper insecure. Like, King Saul is basically a leadership study in itself of here's what you do if you want to be an effective leader. Do the opposite. You you ever known anybody like that? You're like, I can learn so much from you. You don't tell them that. But if I just do the opposite of what you do, I'll do great in my life. I mean, Saul had, like, more issues in his life than South Florida has building regulations. True story. True story. And so the scene is set to where, where David has is, is been anointed. He's been chosen by God to lead the nation. But there's still somebody who's, who's not qualified to really be there on, in that chair. King Saul. And then it's the time to where... The Israelites, the Hebrews, come to stand off. It's this epic standoff with a valley in between against the, this group called the Philistines. And it's in a place called Elah. There in, in your notes in verses 1 through 7, it's this valley of Elah. Now, that doesn't probably mean a whole lot to us, but to understand that this valley, even though it was just a geographical location... It meant control of the entire region. That if you controlled that, it was kind of like the commanding heights, right? That you would be able to control everything else. But here's one factor. The Philistines had Goliath. Something that the Hebrews did not have. And so if you've been around the Bible for any amount of time, you know that David and Goliath is Possibly one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. In fact, you don't even have to go to church. You really don't have to read your Bible. You're probably going to reference it, hear it referenced at some point in some way, David and Goliath. I remember Rocky IV, right, where he's there and he's looking at Ivan Drago, the Russian champion. And the the announcers say, this is like a David and Goliath scenario, right? We're familiar with this. So that's where we're going to go today. We're going to talk about David and Goliath. And here's what I want you to take away this morning as we look at the life of David that it is actually in healthy, sustainable leadership, which is what we all want, right? Like, like nobody here says, I want to be a bad leader. Like nobody wants to be that. We want to have healthy, sustainable leadership. And, and maybe it, it, it's like, you know, I, I don't want to be in that first chair. I don't want to be uh, the person, the COO or CIO or anything that ends with O. And, you know, it's like, I, I, that's just not like, I'm a better second chair person. I like helping someone fulfill that vision and fulfill that purpose. I'm a, I'm a helper. I'm not necessarily a leader. Listen. When you understand that it is your job to help your team, your family, your business, your life, those that you know who don't know Jesus yet, to help those people become what they need to become, that is leadership. And that no matter what you feel your wiring is, where you, whether you feel like you're a strong personality, and usually people who have a strong personality, uh, you can know that because sometimes people run away from you. You intimidate people, and you're like, what's wrong? Then it intimidates them even more, right? And then there's others of us, and we have, we have a, maybe a gentler way of going about it. We have a softer spirit, not a weaker spirit, but a gentle spirit. And what we want to see from the word of God, that when it comes to leadership, it is humility that actually gives us the edge. So they're there in the Valley of Elah. Yes, it was a geographical location on a map, but it represented much more than that. Because if the people of God lost the battle, then the Philistines would have control of the entire hill country of Judah. And then the one who stands before the armies of Israel. The name itself sounds rough, right? Goliath. Like when somebody says, yeah, that's my dog, Goliath, you don't think poodle. (laughs) Right? 
Like there, there's some names that are just like, mm, like they, they just have some punch. They have some bite to them. And Goliath, man, is one of those names. The specs on Goliath is that he was over nine feet tall. And the Bible goes into detail on what this guy literally carried with him into battle. Just the head of his spear weighed 15 pounds. So next time you go to the gym, pick up a 15-pound dumbbell and imagine that is on the end of the shaft of a spear. And the spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. So weavers, you know what I'm talking about, all right? And all two of us in the room, okay. Okay. And, and, and then he had armor that weighed, weighed 125 pounds. Now think about that. Not only is he this foreboding, massive, intimidating character, but it, the Bible says that he had a helmet of bronze on his head. This is the bronze, the bronze age. Not the, the bronze bomber, but the, but the bronze age. That, that was the strongest metal that they had for fashioning tools and weapons of warfare. And he had greaves to protect his legs. And for those of you guys that like studying ancient military history, uh, you know a lot of the times in movies the guys are doing this with their swords. Uh, the, the goal in many cases was to go for the legs because they were unprotected. Because if you take them out at the legs, you can take them out, period. But not only is this guy massive, but he's got all this armor on, and he has a javelin that he can throw that's made out of bronze. And here's, what, here's kind of the kicker. Like, if that doesn't set the stage for, like, you don't want to mess with that guy, he has an armor bearer who's actually, his one job is to bear and carry the shield. Think about that. Like, the guy has one job. What do you do? I'm over the howitzer section. What do you do? I'm in logistics and support. What do you do? Bro, I carry around this big honking shield all day long. I got one job. I'm the shield guy. Everybody calls me turtle. I hate it, but it's my job. Like, how big is this joker to have all of that, and he comes into contact with the people of God. Now, again, this is ancient warfare. If you've read or even, you don't even have to read about it. Just think about the brutality and the primal nature of ancient combat. Isn't this just an enjoyable way to introduce a sermon, right? You guys like that? But you think about, it's very different than modern warfare or call of duty to where you can engage at distances. Sometimes you engage at distances. You can't see them. They can't see you. You're using artillery. This is before that. To where you are facing off Man-to-man, warrior-to-warrior, and you have in your hands the hand weapons that will make the difference between you coming home from the battle. And then you see that monster of a man who literally (laughs) comes onto the battlefield and you do one of these. So Israel's facing off against the Philistines, and then Goliath begins to do something that's predictable. He begins to call everyone out, and there are no exceptions. Notice verse 17, verse 10 in chapter 17. The Philistine says, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Notice notice this. Give me a man that we may fight together. Like, if you can find one, I know you have your army But if you can find him, because from my vantage point, and by the way, I can see everything because I'm Goliath. All I see is a bunch of boys with beards. If you can find a man, give me a man that we may actually fight. And in verse 11, everybody wimps out. And by the way, don't be too hard on them. You take away modern weaponry and you're facing off one-to-one, hand-to-hand combat with somebody like that including the king, wimps out. Notice the Bible says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Just in case greatly afraid doesn't get across the concept, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, if you were here last week, you know, King Saul was the one that the people wanted. They they wanted a king. God's people wanted a king. They said, we want to be like everybody else. And God's like, you're not like everybody else. And by the way, today, if we try to be like the world, we're not like the world. Like, we're not the world. It's not the same thing. God's like, I- I'm, I'm your leader. And they're like, no, 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 we want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. God's basically saying, okay, I'll give you a king, but it will be a king after your own heart. I'll give a king that will reflect where you are as a nation. But God's in search of a man after his own heart. But 
King Saul is head and shoulders, and again, we, we don't know whether the, if, if that's where the shampoo came from or not. The Bible doesn't say. But, but he's head and shoulders above all of the other men in Israel. So think about it. A guy for the Hebrews, for the Israelites, we've got a big dude. You guys have a big guy. Your guy is a little bit bigger than, than our guy, but, but let, let's just let him go in the ring, a super heavyweight, duke it out. Guess where King Saul is? Like, it's one of those things like that's why they pay you the big bucks. Like, get up, cowboy, let's go. Like, it's game time. But he's just sitting back like a coward. From the king all the way down to the privates in the army, they realized because, and we'll come back to this, that as a leader in any level, the leader always sets the tone. What tone did did Saul set for his army? He set the tone of fight or flight. We are going to fly. Like, I'm not a fighter. I'm a flyer. Absolute sheer terror. And while this was happening day after day after day after day to where Goliath would come and he would say these words and the men would be insulted, but they didn't feel like they could do anything, David's dad basically sends him on a snack run to go to the army where his brothers are and bring them some resources. And, and we're going to find that his brothers are actually upset at him when he comes. So he was going to bring some, some supplies. Dad basically, you know, go to Chick-fil-A, get some chick, Christian chicken, bring it to the army along with some cheese. So Eliab, remember Eliab last week is the, uh, is the eldest brother, the one, by the way, who was passed over for the anointing, for the kingship. So he already has an issue. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. So David's there. He's trying to figure out what's going on. Like two armies, why, are, why is there not fighting happening? And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you less, left those? Notice how demeaning this is again. Few sheep in the wilderness. Speaking down to him. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Notice the now. It is probably a pattern in this family. Was it not but a word? We're going to see that wise leadership, healthy leadership, doesn't mean that you argue every argument you're invited to. That you don't take a side battle that keeps you from the main battle. And then David is called in before King Saul. Like you've got this whole army of guys, day after day you're challenged by one guy, nobody volunteers, finally you have one volunteer, and notice how bad King Saul's advice is. It's basically godless advice. Notice you can catch the quality by what Saul doesn't say. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Notice how respectful he is. He doesn't say, let nobody's heart fail like you. He doesn't embarrass the one who is in the leadership role. Your servant will go fight, go out and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, notice, first words, first guy, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Here's the reason, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. So Saul is counseling David out of Saul's insecurity. You see that? He never talks about God. He never even talks about David's character. All he does is he compares the age. And age does not necessarily equate to wisdom. David then credits God with his past victories. And notice how David couches these terms. He says in verse 36, your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. We're going to come back to this, but this is the first ray of hope the men of Israel have heard, that you guys are the armies of the living God. A good, a good leader always sets the right tone for the team. And David said, the Lord who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And what did Saul say? Like, what do you say after that? He says, go and may the Lord be with you. Like, this is not, this is not Saul having his praise break. Y'all all right? It's not Saul like, amen, brother, for the glory of God and for the salvation of the nations, I'm with you. 
Like you look at everything Saul's done, everything he said, God never factors into it. This may be a side point. We'll come back to the application at the end. But be careful about whose advice you take. There are some people that are really passionate about the advice they want to give. But if it is advice that never allows God's perspective into the situation, it is limited advice at best. And notice David tells Saul what he's done. He's like, here's my resume. Killed a lion. Killed a bear. This is, I love the Old Testament. I know some of you guys are like, oh, we're going to be in the Old Testament for four weeks. The Old Testament is awesome. I absolutely love it. Now, some of us were David. We would have been taking selfies of that thing. You know, here, here's me and the bear. Here's me and the lion. And you know, some of us, like the, the story would grow. I found it down in the Everglades. It's actually a mutant. It's, it's a lion and a bear. It's called a bion. Like we would have just, you know, made it like way, way, way bigger than it ever was. But David held all this close to the chest. And when the time came, he shared what he was able to do. And it is appropriate in leadership to share what you can do. But notice how David tracks the victory back to the one who gives the ultimate victory. If it had just stopped, here's what I did, here's what I can do, here's my resume, here's this. And there's nothing beyond that, then it could be self-serving. And there's a fine line in leadership between being honest on what your skill sets are, but being able to take a posture of humility, because humility is what gives us the edge in leadership. And then King Saul, again, predictably, notice this, how he tries to micromanage the situation. Isn't this fascinating? Then Saul clothed David with his armor. Again, head and shoulders, way bigger. David was probably not even old enough to enlist in the army, so it's likely he was a teenager. But Saul's going to like, well, there's only one way it can be done. By the way, that's when you know a bad leader. Well, if it's going to be done, it's got to be done with my armor, with my sword, with my way. And, and this, this is hilarious. Notice, notice the posture of respect that David still has for King Saul. And he put a helmet of bronze on his head. You ever seen a kid put on a helmet that's too big for him? Like when you buy that, 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 that toy uh, football helmet of, and I'm not even going to name a team, whatever your team is, you know, whether it's the home teams here in South Florida, whether it's any team from New York, right, that's, that's the way it is. And, and you, put, you put that helmet on the kid and it just covers them. It's something like this. And clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go. Literally, the Hebrew here says, he tried in vain to walk. That's funny, and I don't care who you are. For he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Notice the the level of respect. He's not trying to out Saul. He's not not, not trying to be smart aleck. Because he he knows Saul is not what he should be. He knows Saul's a terrible leader. Like David already knows this by now. But notice the level of respect that he has even for another leader who's not what he should be. Because humility is what gives you the edge. Some of us think the way that we grow in our leadership is we publicly humiliate someone else on the team. What David understood is that Saul is still on the team. And there is one predictable outcome if I do not give him the respect that he's due as God's anointed. Is is he a terrible guy? Yes. Is he unstable? Yes. Is he a bad leader? Yes. Like all of the negative categories, yes, that's King Saul. He's in charge. But I do know this. David was connected to God to understand that even though Saul's a bad king and a bad leader, there is an absolute guarantee of absolute certainty that if we begin to bite and devour one another... We are doomed, and we don't even need Goliath to go to war against us. And then it gets amazing. David and Goliath begin to exchange words. And the Philistine, verse 43, said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? By the way, this is actually in the Bible. So right here, you know, sometimes we try to, uh, to water down the Bible. It's not always safe for the whole family. And this is possibly the most epic record of trash talking in the Bible, but it's God-anointed trash talking from David. So it's more truth talking. How about that? Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me. Not notice that. Come here. We still see that in the ring today. Come here. 
come, come, come to me, and I will get, now this is where it gets like a whole nother level. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Notice David puts it in perspective. According to David, it's not David versus Goliath. It's Goliath versus God. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Again, he gives the glory to the Lord. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. Next verse, yeah. You don't see that on Christian coffee mugs, do you? And I will give, this is in the Bible. For some of you like, get to the next series. No, we're going to walk through this. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. So David was a wildlife conservationist. That all, and here's the purpose. Here's the purpose. Check this out. Here's the purpose. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. All the earth, all of the nations, all of the Gentiles, all the people without God, so that they would know that God is real and God is here. And that this, all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for sovereignty of God. The battle is the Lord's and he will give you, this is awesome leadership, not into my hand, but into our hand. We are in this battle together. And so then they closed distance. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly. What's it say there in, in verse 48 and 49? Quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in the bag and took out a stone. A few verses before this, he had stopped at a brook and picked up five stones. We know from other chapters in the Bible that Goliath had brothers. And so some believe that David is just being prepared. Others believe that he thinks that he may have to take on the whole family, the, fam the Goliaths, plural. And they may be, maybe the, the model that hung over the mantle of their home is the family that slays together stays together. We really don't know. But he's ready, and he takes out that stone, and he puts it in a sling. And, and this is not a Dennis the Menace rubber, you know, st the sling. He's not out there in the yard uh, shooting a little rock. This is a deadly weapon, a pouch that's held together with two leather straps that by a grown man, you, you swing it, and you swing it like this. I'm not going to ask you to do that. That would all be weird. But he, he begins to sling this, and it is a deadly, deadly weapon. And what, you see, what, what, what Saul was doing the entire time is he was saying, he's so big. He's so big. We can't ever take him down. What David is thinking, it's almost like a good play on Dumb and Dumber. So you're telling me there's a chance. He said, all I need is a small window of opportunity, and it's called the forehead. One shot for the glory of God. And he lets it fly. The stone sank into the forehead, and Goliath was a big dude that tells you the force of the weapon and fell on his face to the ground. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It was the sentiment of the army coming down from the leader who set the tone is Goliath is too big to take on. And David is saying, like many preachers have said, he's too big to miss. And God worked out a victory for the people of God. So let's take a few moments, which is always a meaningless statement coming from a pastor who's preaching a sermon, and look at several leadership insights that we can draw from this text that will help us in our family lives and in our professional lives. Number one, healthy leaders are humble leaders. Healthy leaders are humble leaders. A healthy leader does not have an elevated view of themselves. Because there will be a point, no matter what your role is, and even more so, the more public you become in your role, the more you become known as uh, whatever your profession is. When you're in the spotlight more, there are more people who notice you there, so there will be more people to take shots. There will be more criticism that comes with a greater spotlight. So to be a healthy leader, how do we handle when disrespect comes, because we will face it. You'll face it sometimes from your own team, from your own family members, from those that you're supposed to be fulfilling the mission together with. Here's one way that humility, I believe, can equip us to be a healthy, humble leader. 
do tasks sometimes that are beneath you. For example, if in your office you have someone who comes by to bag up the trash for you, you bag up the trash. And see what happens in your heart when you're doing that. Let's say you have somebody to take care of cleaning up the grounds and you happen to walk past a wrapper on the ground. You're like, Pastor Jeff, for real? For real. You can, and, and here's the thing. You could call somebody to do that because that's somebody's job. But if you kneel down and you pick that up, it is amazing what the Lord will do, even though you may be at a different place on the org chart. You say, that's not my job to humble yourself and to say, I want to be a healthy, sustainable leader. Because Jesus said, he who is greatest of all is he who is servant of all. We see this with David when he followed the order from his dad to take the food to his brothers. Like, can you imagine David? He's like, Dad, I just got passed. Like, all those guys just got passed over. I'm the anointed one. I don't go on snack runs. Like, the king does not do snack resupply. Like, I don't care if I'm getting takeout from from Texas Roadhouse. I don't care if it's Christian chicken from Chick-fil-A. I don't care if I'm going to Big Lots to pick up a sofa or going to Costco to pick up peanuts. The king doesn't go on snack runs. But we see David in humility, in humility, obeying his father to do that, which some would say would be beneath you, David. Healthy leaders also recognize that they set the tone. Remember David before Saul, and again, he was so respectful because he didn't call Saul out in front of all the people, but he said, let no man's heart fail because of him. David hit the nail on the head. He said, the issue is that Goliath is defying the armies of the living God. Man, that was the first positive word that those guys had heard. And people are looking for us in a humble way, in an assertive way, in a strong way to set the right tone. It may be for some of us that the Lord Jesus wants us to step up in our home and be a tone setter for the home. It just got, thank you for that amen, it just got super quiet. I don't know why, I don't know why that just happens. And guys, the thing is, is that even the best leaders can't get everybody to follow them. But we can be a tone setter. Even when Saul was a coward, even when Saul was sitting on his throne when he should have been out on the battlefield, again, David understood, even though Saul is not a good king or a good leader, he did recognize what would happen to the nation of Israel and the army if they began to turn in on themselves. A very practical aspect. It could be that for some of us in our, in our home, we set the tone sometimes by whoever wins the argument wins the war. Without understanding that to set the tone means that the team has to win. The husband and the wife have to win. The kids, we all have to win. And sometimes it means taking one for the team. It means not being recognized as the one who just sent out that torpedo and demolished the battleship of their counter argument. Because even if we win that argument, and they're like, I, you're like, you don't have a comeback, do you? Boom. We just sunk the tone of our home. Leaders set the tone. We will set the tone. May it be that we set the right tone in our families and in our businesses. And for those of you that lead people, they work for you. Think about it in terms of uh, the tone that you set. Would you want to work for this team? And one of the great things that good leaders do is they give away praise. And they don't try to absorb it. Next is healthy leaders uh, care about winning the battle rather than looking important. Oh, my. Oh, my. There are some people that we have encountered in our lives that whether it's in an educational setting, a work setting, or they're in the home, they don't want to actually, they don't actually want the mission to be accomplished. They just want to look good. Remember David's older brother, Eliab? I mean, he's there. He, he, he's at the battle, but he's not doing anything. And he was threatened when David actually showed up and took assertive leadership. You know what's fascinating about this story on that point? That David's older brother looked down on him and put him down verbally. And that's exactly what Goliath did as well. To be a healthy leader, it means understanding there are some times to where people outside of the circle of trust and people within the circle of trust will actually seem to be reading off of the same script. But humility is what gives us the edge because humility is a deep reservoir that we can draw from in times like that. 
We understand that there are some who would rather look busy than be productive. And for us as followers of Jesus Christ, our goal is to fulfill the mission. Amen? To get men and women to see Jesus Christ as the one true Savior. And healthy, healthy leaders on this point, they pick their battles. Imagine if you had been David. You had already been anointed king. You're already important. You've already killed lions and bears. Like, you're already on the rise. Your leadership trajectory is growing. And then you have your oldest brother who's been there at the battle for weeks on end but has not signed up to do anything. You show up, ask a few questions, and he begins to say, I know the evil in your heart. And you're like, what's your problem? Like, do you want to step outside? Actually, we are outside. Let's go. Are you, are you still mad? you need me to call the wambulance for you because God passed over you and came to your younger brother? Like, it would be very easy. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but for a lot of us, it would be very easy to go down that type of a road. But David understood that the battle is not with my older brother. The battle is against Goliath. And what could have happened is David could have started basically a fist fight with his older brother, and all of a sudden you've got a battle line gathering around them saying, fight, fight, fight. But it's the wrong enemy. And I think some of us need to be reminded from time to time, I know that I do, that the enemy is not your family. I don't know, Pastor Jeff, you don't know my... I'm. The goal for healthy leaders is to set the tone. You say, well, every time I turn that tone on, they turn their, their ring tone on. That's a different tone, Pastor Jeff. Let's go back a few months. I can't control anybody else. You can't either. We are responsible for the tone that we set. So even if you've got, if it feels like one against four, one against ten, one against three, you're trying to be positive, you're trying to be humble, you're trying to be Christ-like, and they're pushing back on it with everything that they have, guess what? At the end of the day, they are responsible to God for their tone, and you're responsible to God for yours. Healthy leaders also wear their own armor. Healthy leaders understand that it is their job to fulfill their ministry, not someone else's. So be careful of the, the leadership advice that you receive from some people because they may want you to lead as they lead, and you may not be wired like them. Again, there are some of us that are very aggressive, very type A, and there are others of us that are, that are more persuasive. We're, we're a little bit uh, not weaker, but softer in the way that we can guide people through roadblocks. So fulfill your ministry. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. I think one of the greatest things that you can do in your life is on a regular basis take godly people out for lunch. And here's what you do. You say, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm doing, whether it's on a business level, a personal finance level, a relational level, here's how I'm, you know, trying to relate to my husband or, or my wife. You know, I married my wife. I thought she was one way, and she ends up, you know, like her and her mother, or like her mother-in-law, they're, they're teaming up against me. Like, how do, how do I do? You say, here's what I'm thinking. It got quiet again right there. i got to stop doing that. I'm going to try. <laughs> Is you seek godly counsel. Spending $10, $25 for lunch with a godly person, guys, that will reap dividends beyond your wildest imagination. But here's the reason why some of us, it's been years, maybe never, have asked someone else who knows Jesus, who's walking, who's a good, emotionally aware, a well-read leader, who's walking with the Lord, who's also competent. It's the reason because some of us, we, we don't feel secure enough to do it. We feel like if we say, well, here's what I'm thinking, that they may shoot that down. And we feel like what we're thinking, our idea or our struggle, that that is synonymous with our self-worth. Brothers and sisters, we are valuable because of whose we are. We are sons and daughters of the king, which should allow us to be able to have the reservoir to put ourselves out there in a one-on-one -on -one situation and say, what do you think? He who walks with wise men or wise women will be wise. 
That is one of the greatest things you can do, especially if you're a student. I know this is spring break week. We have a few college students here, some of our high school students who didn't head out, out of town. If you could begin to develop that as a student and carry that through your professional career, there is no telling how far God can take you. And here's the reason. Even if you think you've got an 85% grasp on what you want to do, an idea that you have, it could be that God uses your humility and that person's advice to give you another 5%. So now you're 90% on target instead of 85%. And that 5% through humility, because again, humility is what gives us the edge, can make all the difference in the world. But what it requires is for a person to be able to have a heart of humility and say, here's what I'm thinking. My security is in Jesus. It's not in my projects. It's not in my degrees. It's not in my good looks. My security is in Jesus, which allows us to be able to learn from other godly people. Quickly, because we run out of time basically every week, welcome to our lives, right? Healthy leaders give away rather than seek praise. We're going to dive into that in greater detail next week. Healthy leaders are forward thinkers. It's a sign of mature leadership when we think beyond the day, beyond the week. And finally, healthy leaders have a God-centered motivation for leading. Leaders, healthy, sustainable leaders to where we don't drive ourselves into the ground or crush other people into the dirt. We have a God-centered motivation for leading. And here's the reason. We say we want to see as many people become followers of Jesus Christ through our life as possible before we die. That's our goal, to bring glory to God by helping people come close to Jesus Christ. So if it means that we have a greater leadership role, a wider spotlight, so be it. But we don't seek the spotlight for the sake of the spotlight. And that's where we're going to go next week. I can't wait till we get to next week because we're going to talk about what happens when we have success. When the winds begin to mount up, when the dreams come true, uh, how do we prepare ourselves for success? Because the way that human nature often thinks is we've got to prepare for the tough times, right? I've got to prepare for the tough times. And when we're going through a tough time, it seems like we're so tight with the Lord, Right? Like, we're, Lord, I'm, I'm praying, I'm listening to Christian music, I'm reading my Bible. Lord, help me get through this valley. I want to submit to you, and we're going to go there in detail next week, that it's often the valleys that are not the most challenging times in our lives. It's when we are high on the mountaintop. Great Bible commentator Matthew Henry said, see how slippery the high places are. Next week, we're going to see David, this leadership trajectory that continues to grow, some mind-blowing wins and successes that he had. And we're going to examine the question of leadership and success and what does success, what does power actually reveal, and how do we prepare for that? Because great, greatness, true greatness, it begins out of the spotlight. Amen? And it's humility that gives us the edge.